Thank you, Roberto. And um, this is work that I've done with other people at Monash University, Maxime, Chris, Chris Mears, Guido Tak. And um, I said I'm from Monash, but I also have him there, there because I'm having a six month sabbatical in wonderful Madrid, Spain. Okay, so this morning, Peter has already talked about the holy grail, right? How do you solve uh, an optimization problem? It's really easy, in theory. You model it, you have a problem, and you have a model. And then you get some data, and your job is done. Then you just trust the compiler and the solver to do the thing, right? So depending on the compiler, that's different things. But mostly, what it does is gets those two things, the model and the data, and builds an instance, which is nothing else than you see the model that uh, Peter showed for the graph coloring and the data, it just basically puts it together. And then the compiler, depending on the solver that you chose, you selected this, uh, it will look at the solver and it will compile down this wonderful instance into something the solver can understand. And it will be, you're not supposed to see this really, but it's a very long thing, or it might be a very long thing, um, that basically is, is uh, done by unrolling, unfolding all those loops, perhaps it has to decompose global variables, and in general has to transfer, transform this very high-level model into something the solver will understand. Then he gives it to the solver, and then comes a the solution. Now, modelers usually, often, uh, don't want to just use one solver, they might want to use a different solver. And then the compiler compiles again to the solver and gives, hopefully, the same solutions, perhaps faster. And might do for another one and another one. And the reason for this, for trying different solvers, is that there are many different kinds of them. Some of them are great for linear um, equations, some of them are great for uh, Boolean um, formulas, some of them are great for nonlinear, whatever. And even when your problem fits beautifully one of these kinds of problems, there might be several solvers that implement different um, variants of that solution. So there's a huge amount of technology out there to solve your problem. And you want to figure out your model, does it solve better with this or better with that? And in fact, the picture is a little bit more complex because as Arnaud told us this morning, different models yield different uh, speeds. So he had one with just um, GCC constraints, another one with a mix, and they had quite a different um, uh, solutions. So different, or order, even orders of magnitudes on speed. So the picture is a little bit more complex. The picture is a, an iterative process in which a modeler builds a model, tests it, changes the model, tests it again, tries again, and keeps on having a, a, an iteration until hopefully finds something that is good, that is a really good model. Now, need, this needs lots and lots of expertise, usually one or more PhDs. And our aim, the aim of our team, is to support modelers in finding good models as soon as possible. Now, how does this usually work in, um, in general in programming languages by automatically providing tools that improve those programs. So in general, the typical thing is you find a useful transformation. For example, you're going to automatically parallelize some program. Then you find a property that enables that transformation. If this call and this call are independent, go for it because it's safe and it's fast. Great. Then you develop an analyzer that infers that property. It tells you the independence in your program. And then you use that to transform the, the program to parallelize it. Now, this works quite well in a lot of different languages. But for constraint or discrete optimization, there's not a lot around for this. There's not a lot of analyzers because they're very, very difficult. And in general, there's two, two, two sides. Most of the um, analyzers work on the program side, so in this very long thing. Why? because at that time, you already have all the information you need. You have the exact number of variables, the exact number of constraints. There might be thousands of them, or lots of them, but, but you have them all. On the other hand, it's somewhat not useful, because the information that you get is useful for that program, but it's not useful for all the data. If you have several you know, different graphs, or you have different all the things, it's only useful for that particular program. And also, it could be impractical because it's so big that you might not be able to do uh, analysis of, of complex properties. All the analyzers go and analyze at the model level. So just consider the model without the data. 
Now, this is great, because if you find something, if you find a property, then you can use that property to, tr to be useful for any instance, for any data that you can have on that model, um, which is great. It also could be quite practical, because models tend to be rather small. So you're going to uh, finish quite soon. But they tend to be quite inaccurate, because you don't have the data. So you might not be able to infer the property that you wanted to infer. So we thought that we would do something, in some sense, a bit like what Costis did with Concolic, concrete, uh, use of concrete data, but to infer things about the model itself. So we, you, we use instances to infer properties that then are kind of generalized to the model symbols, to the variables in the models. And rather than talking about variable 1, 200, and 1,025, they said all the variables in the row of your matrix are whatever, independent, etc. And we have done this, using this technology, we have done several things. For example, we have um, developed an analyzer that infers global constraints. This morning, Arnaud was saying, I'm not an expert in, in global constraints. There might be global constraints out there that I could have used. Well, we have developed an analyzer that can tell them, uh, the modeler, this part of your model is actually equivalent, or it could be equivalent to this global constraint. If so, substitute it, because you're going to go much faster. There's also uh, an analyzer that we have done for inferring model symmetries. For example, in graph coloring, once you have a solution, and you have blue, some nodes are blue, and some nodes are red, any permutation of those colors, you can swap reds and blues, that's still a solution. And any non-solution is also uh, a symmetric, symmetric to a non-solution. So if you know the symmetries of your problem, you can avoid searching through the symmetric search space. So you reduce the search space a lot, and you can go fast. And like that, we have done different things with dominance constraints, etc. Now, once we look at that, we thought, hey, wouldn't it be, rather than just looking at the model, how about looking at the solvers? Can we help the modeler decide is the solver good or is the solver not good for your, for your model? And in particular, we were very interested in learning solvers. Why? Well, for explaining that, I have to explain a little bit of a constraint programming, which we have been talking today a lot about it, so hopefully I don't, it's already very clear in the mind of, of people. So, I'm talking about solvers that deal with discrete variables, uh, finite domain variables. And also, they can handle many, many times of, of constraints. Why? Because they implement them very simply as propagators or domain filters. Um, Arnold explained it very well this morning with the boxes that we're reducing. Uh, my example is a little bit uh, more pedestrian. You have a constraint, x less equal than y, and you have the domains of the variables, x goes from 1 to 10, and y goes from th 3 to 15. And you have a propagator, or the constraint, is just implemented as a little thing that is there waiting, and is waiting, and is waiting. And at some point, x changes from 1 to 10 to 5 to 10. So the lower bound has changed from 1 to 5. And the propagator wakes up and goes, hey, there has been a change. What can I do? And it figures out that y can no longer be 3, because it has to be greater or equal than, than x, and x is at least 5, and it cannot be 4 either. So it's going to end up changing y to 5 to 15. right? And then it tries to change anything else. There's nothing else to change, and stops. Right. So what happens? How does the execution go? We have seen, we even have seen, Roberto has shown us a tree of how this happens. But basically, it's nothing else than what Arnold described as labeling plus filter and propagation. So you take a decision, x equals 1, y equals 2, whatever is the decision, and then you propagate, propagate, propagate. And you keep on doing this. I take another decision, another decision, another decision, until something happens. Either you have a failure, and you backtrack and try a different decision, or you find a solution. And you either return the solution, or if you're in optimization, you try for a better one. I want a better one. And you end up going on until you, you, you search the entire search space, basically. So Roberto show us trees that look a little bit like that. Each blue node is, I take a decision, another decision, another decision. Then I get to the green rhomboid, which is a solution. Wow, I found a solution. And then what it does is, I want a better one. And it backtracks, and the red um, squares are failures. And you start backtracking, and then you try another one, and then you try another solution, and you keep on going. Now, this is a search tree for the graph coloring that Peter was showing this morning. Now, executed with G-code, which is uh, a 
a fantastic solver, one of the best CP, uh, and most popular CP solvers developed by Christian's group. And it takes about, you cannot see really, but about 3,000 nodes, right? Of uh, between um, a search and uh, etc. Now, that is exactly the same instance. So, same model, same data, but sold with a different solver. This is a learning solver called Chaft. And all together, it takes less than 100 nodes. So from 3,000 to 100 nodes, right? Why? Because of learning solvers. Learning solvers are incredibly powerful. Very, very powerful. Um, they outperform most solvers in the Minising Challenge that Peter talked about. Every year, we do a competition among solvers in CP. They usually tend to outperform everything, but they can also perform appallingly badly. And no one knows really why, or in some sense, when to predict. Is it going to perform well, or is it going to perform not well? It's not that clear. It's not easy to predict, because they are so, in some sense, opaque. You don't know what the solver is doing. So we thought, let's develop something that can tell us you know, how to understand these solvers better, and to see whether your model should use it or should not use it. Now, while we were doing this, we discovered something much, much more interesting. That is the solver. Rather than us understanding the solver, actually the solver was telling us things about our model. The solver was understanding our model much better than we were understanding our model, and could tell us things about how to improve it. And I'm going to explain this uh, by means of two examples. But so, so yeah, we use them to improve our models. Now, to, ex to explain a little bit, uh, to explain why, I have to tell you a little bit, not much about learning solvers. So learning solvers, um, as I said, are a kind of constraint programming uh, combined with SAT. How? They modify propagators, so the constraints, not only filter the domains and propagate, but also explain the reasons. So if you have a constraint saying x1 is equal to x2, and you know both variables are domain 1 to 4, if at some point we said x1 is equal to 1, the propagator is going to wake up and is going to say x2 can no longer be 1, right? Um, learning solvers change the propagators to, in addition to do this, they record the reason. And they record the fact that x2 cannot be 1 because x1 was 1. So it is x1 be being equal to 1 that has made it um, x2 not be equal to 1. And they use this later. So they record this, and there's a huge graph that, that basically is recorded. Um, and in the future, they use it. And they use it when they fail to do two things. Well, the first thing that they do is they record um, a, a no good, a reason for the failure. So every of those red boxes has a reason for the failure. And then this can be used in two ways, to back jump and to reduce the search that I prefer to explain with an example. So imagine that you are in, in this um, uh, graph, and let's assume that uh, at some point we have um, failed and we have inferred no good at that particular point. That no good could allow us to do two things. The first thing is to back jump. So we will not have to go back to there and, use all, and, and explore all this. We can go all the way back there. Because the no-good will tell us that those decisions are actually totally relevant. To the, to, to changing them is, is, is not going to make any difference to the failure. We're going to keep on failing. So there's no point in changing it. We can go all the back to the source of the, of the error, which is earlier. The second thing that it's going to do is I then will post the constraint. I will post the no-good, negation, but doesn't matter. I will post the, the constraint. And then in the future, it will allow me to avoid all that. So it immediately eliminates all that and saying, if I go there, I'm redoing the same mistake, so don't go there, basically. Right? So it allows you to go back to the relevant decisions and allows to not to fall twice on the same mistake. So they are great. Now, what we did, we wanted to understand the solvers. So what we did was go to the Minising Challenge and select um, uh, several um, problems. The ones in which the learning solvers were either very good or very bad. We wanted to know when does it go well, when does it go badly. And then we modified our CP profiler, which is uh, uh, um, basically a tool to analyze the execution of, of programs. And we used it with two solvers, one with learning, chaff, one with our learning, G-code, which is a really good solver. And then we study them and, and we explore them. And I'm going to present the results of it, two case studies. We did many more, but those, those two were, um, are enough for explaining what we found. The pizza model. 
incredibly simple, but suits our purposes. Um, we want several pizzas, and those pizzas have a price, right? 70, 60, wow, something very expensive, 100. And then we have vouchers. And the vouchers say, for example, that says that if I pay for one pizza, I get one free. If I pay for two pizzas, I get one free. If I pay for three pizzas, I get one free. But not just any pizza for free. The pizza that I get for free has to be cheaper or equal to the ones that I pay for, right? So for example, that voucher, I pay for those three, then I can get that one for free, because 60 is cheaper than any of those pizzas. I could also get something that is 70. But if I try, wow, but if I try to get something that is 71, I cannot get it, right? OK, so that's the problem. And of course, the aim of the problem is to get all the pizzas that I want and to minimize the price, right? Because I don't want to pay more than I want to. That's a, no, a possible optimal solution, but not relevant. OK. so. I go and execute, I'm studying a learning solver. I go and execute it, and I end up with something like this, about 2,000 failure nodes. So about 2,000 of the nodes. Now, each of those triangles can hide lots of failure nodes inside. But basically, that is telling me all that tree is a failure. Nothing underneath has a solution. And, it has, and those things are solutions, the little rumbles. Now, chaff, 2,000 nodes. That's good, bad, I don't know. So. I don't know whether that was good or bad, and I definitely have no idea of whether no good learning was useful. So how can I do? How can I learn something about it? Well, we decided, let's run it without learning. Let's write, rather than chaff, I want to run G-code that has no learning. So I run it, and rather than 2,000 failure nodes, now we have 21,000 failure nodes, right? So obviously, this is worse. But why? Why is it worse, right? Is it, is it because of no good learning? Or, or the only thing that I've learned up to now is that an order of dip magnitude difference in the, in the speed, but I haven't learned much. So if I want to learn why, I somehow, I need to put them one beside the other one, right? The one done by Chaff and the one done by G-Code, and I need to compare them somehow. But in order to do that, the first thing that I have to do is to actually make sure that they use the same search, because the search that this guy uses and the search that this solver uses are taught or might be totally different. And it might be that the difference in the search, nothing to do with learning. It might be that if chaff, if, if G code follows the same search as chaff, actually that's equal or better than, than so we did. So what we did is to make sure that the search decisions were the same. How did we do this? Well, we took our CP profiler and we executed first with learning. So we executed, and we actually recorded the decisions. So these two trees are the same. The only difference is that the second one is showing the decisions I took, right? And now I write down these decisions, I record them. <laughs> I promise you I'm not doing that. <laughs> and um, I record this, and I put it aside, right? That's the same thing. I put it aside, and now I force uh, G-code to follow the same search, the same search. And I execute it, and I obtained um, something that is almost identical. So those parts are identical. The only differences are in these circles. And those are the parts at that point in time, that point, that point, that point, and that point, the no good made chaff fail. But Jiko doesn't have the no good, so he kept on searching. right? So I have exactly the same two things, but in some points, the no learning a solver goes further and keeps on searching and keeps on searching. So now I have a much better idea of the impact of these things. So what I do as a third, so now I have, when I run it for pizza, I now have what I had before, Chaff, and the new one that is 18,000. So that has gone down from 21,000 to 18,000. So obviously the search did have an impact, right? The search has, was better and now G-code only takes 18,000 failure nodes. But still, from 2,000 to 18,000, it means that the search is finally the same, but the no goods do have an impact. An impact, a very significant one, right? But I still don't really know how. What, what you know, how do I find these differences? Well, what we did is, as I said, this is the things that we're interested on. So we merge the two executions. So we 
what we do is to end up merging those two trees into a single tree that has these special symbols, these pentagons. Those pentagons say, underneath this, there's differences, right? On this side is what G uh, Chaff did, on this side is what Jico did. Chaff, Jico, Chaff, Jico, Chaff, Jico, right? Now suddenly have a much better idea of what the impact is, but this is not enough. This does not tell me much about the power of no goods. The four things that we did is let's rank those no goods. Remember that every single failure node can generate a no good. So I might have thousands upon thousands of them. Which ones are the ones that are any good? I want to rank them. So we did. So what we did was for every no good, I tell, you know, this no good, A, is responsible for this cut. A and B are both responsible for this failure. And I collected all this information. And I collected it, and we said, OK, wonderful. Um, A has 7 plus 3, B has 3. And I rank them by the amount of search that they eliminate. And we did that for the pizza problem. And um, these are the top no goods, some of the top no goods. And the search reduction was huge. And when we study those no goods, we found amazing things. Now, to understand what we found, you have to understand how it was represented. So basically, how P of plus B means that we can get pizza P for free with voucher V. If it's positive, yeah, it's for free, voucher V. If it's negative, oh, we have to pay for it. But at least we, we um, activate a voucher. And if it's zero, we just pay it and nothing else. So something like this says, I have to pay for pizza two to activate voucher one. And this says, I can get four for free to, um, using voucher one. Right, so when we started looking at the top no goods, we realized that this really, what was telling us, is that none of those pizzas, five, eight of none, can be used to get pizza three via voucher three. That's what it says when you actually study and go back to the thing. And of course this is true, because when we look at the data, it was telling us that Pizza 3 is more expensive than any other other ones. So you cannot get it for free, because it's more expensive. And in fact, the voucher number is irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether it's voucher 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You can never get that pizza for free. And the interesting point is that we could pinpoint that those no goods belong to one single constraint in the model, and one only. Um, but if it's one constraint, there's no need to learn things about a single constraint. That constraint should be enough. The only reason why a no good is learned for a single constraint is if that constraint is not propagating well, if it's not strong enough. So whenever you have a no good that point points to a single constraint, it means that that constraint is not good enough. You can actually, and I'm not going to explain exactly how, but basically we could change that by that, and suddenly you don't need to learn any of those no goods. Those no goods are already in that constraint, and you don't need to learn them anymore. And once we have found those no goods, we can actually f understood, uh, <laughs> we can understand a much longer one, which basically is saying nothing else than Pixar 6 is more expensive than anything else. And therefore, because it's more expensive than anything else, you're never going to pay for, get it for free. Be real. And the uh, equivalent for Pizza 2, which is the cheapest. And since it's the cheapest of them, you better get, you're never going to be activating a voucher with it. You either get it for free or you have to pay for it. Now, of course, we cannot put those things in the model because that relates to that one particular data file, right? But we can generalize. We can say that for any pizza, if that pizza is more expensive than anything else, um, then that pizza has to be paid. You can activate a voucher or not, but you have to pay for it. There's no positive. There's no for free. And if something is the cheapest, then either you pay for it, it's zero, or you get it for free. That is a redundant constraint. That's something that your model didn't have before, but now by having it, can go much faster. And this is the speed. We run the old, this is the time taken for the old original model, and this is the modified model. Anything underneath means we're now going faster. And this is logarithmic um, uh, time. So. The sur surprise was not that not only G-code was going faster, but actually Chaff, after the modification of those two, adding those redundant constraints and strengthening, it was actually going faster too. Why? Because he didn't need to learn those, those um, uh, no-goods. He was already there. He could learn something else. And 
The other interesting part was that we could do this iteratively. I don't have the time to uh, explain exactly how, but basically meant I run it once, I find a redundant constraint, I add it, I run it again, and I find a different redundant constraint, and I can do this forever. In fact, for this one, it meant that if I study a little bit manually, I can generate, um, generalize to this very generic constraint, which is the same that these people discovered by hand in 2005. And that's pretty much, um, and again, when we run this thing, both solvers are benefited. So in conclusions, we have developed an instance-based, uh, so concrete and symbolic based mode analysis to automatically rank no goods in learning solvers. And interestingly, that has helped uh, modelers identify weaknesses in the models, either constraints that are not strong enough or constraints that need to be added. If you add it, then you will go faster. It's interesting because it's a solver-driven improvement. The learning solver knows a model better than we do and can pinpoint things that said, that's not a very good thing, change it. It can be applied iteratively and it works even when the learning solver does not win. For the second example, um, Chaff was actually very bad. G-code was better, but still could tell us something. The only thing, the last steps are manual. The analysis and the going back to the symbols have to be done by hand. That part is the part that we need to get better. And that's the part that we're working for right now. And that's it. Uh, let me play devil's advocate. Absolutely. You always do. Right. Okay. So forget about G-code. Rubbish. You know, old technology. Uh, we use Chaft. Chaft is um, a learning solver. So why care about improving the models? Chaft is going to find it out anyway. Um, it might and it might, uh, might not. First of all, Chaff will find it anyway but you might not want to use Chav, you might want to use something else like, um, um, not Gcode, but some other hybrid, or for example, MIP and Chav or something like that, and you might want to have a redundant constraint that some other technology will, will find better. But second, remember <coughs> that any extra information that is useful might be used by another analyzer that can, an right? So one of the base, uh, as I show in, in another um, slide, we have analyzers that can infer global constraints, that can infer symmetries, that can have any structure that is useful to add to the model can help those things. So it might be that it's not good for any other solver, but it might be good for an analyzer that actually can tell the user what to do. Also, because sometimes you want dual models, right? And yeah, that's the, that's the best answer that I can think of. Okay, next thanks. Uh, Maria again. Thank you. And um, <laughs> here you go. Thank you. <laughs>